In a chilling case that sent shockwaves across Nigeria, the notorious gracious David West, a 40-year-old man, was sentenced to the ultimate punishment of death by hanging in the vibrant southern city of Port Harcourt. With his dark and twisted actions, this merciless individual claimed the lives of nine innocent women, leaving the entire nation in a state of outrage and disbelief. The harrowing details of his crimes revealed a sinister modus operandi, as prosecutors unveiled a horrifying timeline spanning from July to September 2019. With a cold and calculated approach, David West targeted unsuspecting victims in hotel rooms scattered throughout the country, preying on their vulnerability. These heinous acts of violence involved him methodically strangling each victim, extinguishing their precious lives without remorse. Presiding over the trial, the esteemed Justice Adolphus Ennibelli recognized the gravity of David West's atrocities and handed down the sentence of death by hanging, a punishment rarely implemented in Nigeria. In fact, the last three executions in the country occurred back in 2016, underscoring the severity and exceptional nature of this case. Amongst the dark cloud cast by this series of murders, there was a glimmer of hope when one courageous woman managed to survive David West's brutal attack. However, despite the crucial information she possessed, she did not testify as a witness during the trial. Authorities diligently advised her not to leave the state to ensure her safety, yet her current whereabouts remain unknown, leaving a lingering sense of concern and mystery. The judge, acknowledging the evidence of David West's attempted murder, found him guilty on this charge, shedding light on the fact that his reign of terror was even more widespread than initially believed. Shockingly, the remorseless killer confessed to six additional murders committed elsewhere, though due to a lack of concrete evidence, he was not formally charged for those crimes. These revelations only serve to deepen the chilling narrative of his gruesome acts. Authorities closely examined the pattern of these horrific murders, concluding that they bore the disturbing hallmarks of a serial killer. David West's twisted ritual involved engaging in sexual acts with his victims before ruthlessly binding their arms and feet with strips torn from white sheets. These same sheets were then used as instruments of death depriving each woman of her final breath. It was a macabre tapestry of horror that unfolded in hotel rooms, leaving a trail of devastation in its wake. When the case first came to light, David West initially pleaded guilty to the murders, sending shockwaves through the courtroom. Recognizing the gravity of the crimes committed, the judge, unfazed by this admission, demanded a full trial. Authorities, at the time, suspected that he may have had accomplices in his gruesome acts, but despite their best efforts, no concrete evidence materialized during the course of the trial. As the news of these brutal slayings spread like wildfire, the citizens of Port Harcourt were consumed by a collective sense of outrage. Filling the streets with fervor, they demanded swift justice and a resolution to the terrifying string of murders that had gripped their city in fear. The urgency to solve these heinous crimes became paramount, as the community refused to rest until the perpetrator was apprehended. Finally, on a fateful day in September 2019, the net began to close in on David West. Trying to flee Port Harcourt, he was apprehended by authorities, bringing an abrupt end to his reign of terror. Closed-circuit television footage had captured his departure from a hotel, and once this photo circulated on social media, it quickly went viral, intensifying the manhunt. Security forces, fueled by a renewed sense of determination, located him in a commercial bus bound for Uio in Aqua Ibom State, a mere 45 minutes away from Port Harcourt. As the final chapter of this horrendous saga unfolds, the nation grapples with the haunting legacy of gracious David West. His name, forever etched into the annals of Nigeria's dark history, 
serves as a chilling reminder of the depths of human depravity. May the victims find solace in the fact that justice has been served. While the scars left on the nation's collective memory continue to heal, slowly but surely. David West, a notorious criminal, was born and raised in the picturesque fishing town of Baguma in Rivers State. Nestled along the breathtaking coastline, this oil-producing community is renowned for its pristine beaches and rich cultural heritage. However, beneath its tranquil facade lies a tumultuous history particularly during the early 2000s when Nigeria's Niger Delta region was plagued by oil militancy. Baguma, with its intricate network of mangrove swamps, became a haven for oil militants, including David West. He was a member of the feared Greenlanders, a mafia-styled street gang that emerged from the ranks of armed militant groups. The town's residents often lived in fear of these militants, who operated with impunity. In a complex family dynamic, David West was born into a polygamous home, yet he and his mother led a separate life from the rest of the family. This upbringing, combined with the influences of his environment, shaped his troubled path. His encounters with the law were marked by his quick-tempered nature and a propensity for interrupting judges, even in the presence of his own legal representation. Despite having a lawyer, he often took matters into his own hands, attempting to defend himself in court. The police investigations into David West's activities uncovered a disturbing pattern. He frequented low-budget hotels in the heart of Port Harcourt, as well as those on the outskirts, where security was lax and surveillance cameras were absent. It was in these shadowy corners that he committed heinous acts. One chilling incident took place in the infamous Rungwola area of Port Harcourt, a well-known red-light district. Within the confines of a brothel, he mercilessly took the life of a sex worker, sending shockwaves through the community. The vulnerability of these establishments made them easy targets for his sinister motives. Throughout the trial, the absence of friends and family members of the victims was striking. With the exception of one victim's father, who attended the trial's opening day, it seemed as though these women were forgotten their identities lost in the vastness of the city. It was as if they had vanished without a trace, leaving behind no one to seek justice on their behalf. The extent of David West's atrocities extended beyond Port Harcourt. He confessed to the gruesome murders of six other women in various states across Nigeria, including Abia, Imo, Edo, and Lagos. However, Due to a lack of concrete evidence and the absence of witnesses, he was not charged for these additional crimes. The identities of these women remain shrouded in uncertainty, and the mystery of how they fell prey to the killer's deception persists. Investigators revealed that David West employed a deceitful tactic to lure his victims. Posing as a military officer, he enticed vulnerable women with promises of substantial financial rewards in exchange for their time. This ruse, coupled with their desperate circumstances, proved to be a deadly combination, leading these unsuspecting women into the clutches of a remorseless predator. David West's reign of terror cast a dark shadow over Baguma and its neighboring communities. The scars left behind remind us of the dangers that can lurk beneath the surface of even the most idyllic settings. The chilling tale of his heinous act serves as a somber reminder of the need for vigilance and the pursuit of justice in the face of evil. In a harrowing series of events that unfolded in the vibrant city of Port Harcourt, Nigeria, one of the victims, the vivacious and full-of-life Jennifer Nwaka, embarked on a journey from Lagos to celebrate her eagerly anticipated birthday. Little did she know that her joyous occasion would turn into a nightmare that would haunt the city's consciousness for years to come. Jennifer's path crossed with her assailant at the luxurious hotel she had chosen for her stay. 
As the sun dipped below the horizon, they found themselves engrossed in lively conversation, their laughter filling the air as they exchanged pleasantries. In a gesture of camaraderie, they shared their contact information, oblivious to the dark fate that awaited Jennifer later that night. Under the shroud of darkness, the sinister shadows revealed a chilling truth. Determined to silence any cries for help, the assailant brandished a menacing knife, forcing Jennifer and her unsuspecting companions into submission. Their hopes of raising an alarm were swiftly quashed as fear gripped their hearts, rendering them powerless against the unfolding horror. The assailant, driven by a wicked desire for material gain, callously stripped the victims of their money, ATM cards, and treasured possessions. Leaving them vulnerable and defenseless, he proceeded to subject them to the most degrading and heinous acts imaginable. When the authorities discovered the lifeless bodies of the victims, a scene of unspeakable brutality unfolded before their eyes. The victims, now exposed and vulnerable, were cruelly bound by a stark white strip of cloth, their limbs tightly restricted, and their voices silenced. The chilling tableau presented an eerie contrast to the idyllic surroundings, leaving investigators and onlookers alike stunned by the depth of the depravity. Rumors of ritualistic undertones began to circulate, sparking an unsettling atmosphere of fear and suspicion within the community. Yet, despite these whispers, concrete evidence eluded the grasp of the investigators, leaving them to grapple with the inexplicable motives behind such savagery. Among the survivors of this ordeal, Benita Etim, a resilient young sex worker, emerged as a symbol of strength amidst the darkness that engulfed Port Harcourt. Having spent a torturous night with the remorseless killer, her escape seemed nothing short of a miracle. However, her testimony would forever remain unheard, as authorities declared her whereabouts unknown, despite their directives to remain within the state's confines. In a heart-wrenching account, Benita recounted the nightmarish details of her entrapment. As she described the despicable acts of violence and violation committed against her, the words trembled upon her lips, reawakening the raw anguish that still lingered within. Bound to a chair, her body a testament to the cruel restraints imposed upon her, she found herself at the mercy of a malevolent force. In a desperate bid for survival, Benita's muffled cries pierced through the silence, only to be drowned out by the blaring volume of the television and the incessant hum of the nearby power generator. Her pleas for mercy fell on deaf ears, as the assailant callously severed her connection to the outside world, fleeing the scene with her phone, leaving her trapped in the clutches of despair. Hope however, flickered within the depths of Benita's spirit. Summoning every ounce of strength and determination, she managed to free herself from the stifling gag that had held her captive, unleashing a primal scream that echoed through the corridors of the hotel. It was the cry of survival, a plea for deliverance that would not go unanswered. The hotel staff, alerted by the piercing sound, rushed to her aid, their faces etched with horror as they beheld the wounded soul before them. Benita's miraculous escape from the clutches of death ignited a renewed sense of urgency among the authorities, as they vowed to bring her assailant to justice and put an end to the reign of terror that had cast a dark shadow over the city. As the investigation raged on, the city of Port Harcourt found itself gripped by an indescribable fear forever scarred by the chilling events that had unfolded within its confines. The memory of Jennifer Nwoka and the other victims would forever be etched into the collective consciousness, a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the lengths to which evil can permeate society.
after that, we were inside the club. After that, she discussed how much I would pay her. So, after that, we left the club to the hotel. And what is the name of the hotel? Do you, can you remember the name of the hotel? Okay, that's all. Yes, Rupo. 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 Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, so what happened when you So after that, we went to the hotel. Yes. I paid for the place. So they took her to the hotel. So after that, you know, I said, okay, let me prepare a challenge for the food. I should eat for myself. So they prepared food and we ate. So after that, we slept till. When did they go? By around that 5.30. Yes, 5.30 to rest at 4 or 5.30. So I brought that in life. She didn't actually know that there was a knife there. So I brought that in life. That was she had a lot of shots. Then she shot and we used the knife. Take this girl in the hotel and how do you kill them? Because we have seen similar things, modus, the same modus of rendering. Tell us how do you do the killing in, in when you enter the hotel. What, how, when, and wh around what time you do this? I, I, I find a knife from this house up, kitchen knife. Kitchen knife? Yes, sir. This is the house up that I used to throw shock. So when, when we go inside the hotel after eating, after making knife, we sleep for some time. So after sleeping, after I bath some time, the girl, I wake the girl. But to be able to, uh, when she sleeps, I would not hold on her leg. I now use the knife. I let her down let her shout. If she shout before that, I'll go on and tell her to push her up. So I told her if she shout that I will kill her with this on her leg. So with that first, the girl will not shout. After that, I will not remove the knife from her mouth. I told her I'll let her last go through to play. If not, I will kill her, but she could play for a bit kill her. So the girl will not relax. She will not really be dragged with me. I will not tell her that this is what I will do to her. I will not kill her, but I will try and kill her. To use that to deceive her. So after that, I will tear the pillowcase on the on the on the pillow. She will hold that tear the pillowcase. After tearing the pillowcase, I use the towel and the next part. I want to kill her. She will not be able to drag her with me. That will do it. Then uh, after that one, you told her that uh, you used to ask her about the pin number of her ATM. Yes. Some of them will tell me with that fear that please I don't know but they have money in their account so we don't tell them to write to us there but I'm going to do have money in their account but I'm going to do that I should check your business on your phone but then I've used the knife on the person that the person will be for food the person will not tell me that I have to say no they will not check it that's it sir how does he collect the money? so after you kill her you will not go outside in the ATM card ATM and remove the money I was still inside the hotel, one day I was broken. Two to three hours, the one day I was broken. I was sitting in the chair. Then when I was still to that eight, maybe if the laundry has not got my clothes, I was after the washing because my dad would bring me by eight. They told us that the clock has to be dry, they don't have the dryer. So they bring me by eight or nine. And after wearing the clothes, I will not leave the hotel. Okay, so now tell us how many girls, according to your own, uh, on the court, how many girls using Potter Court you have killed? How many? Five. I know the hotels. You know the hotels in Kenya? Yes. But I did one in Lagos. Who is it? In Lagos. Which one you did first? Is it the one in Lagos or the one in Potter Court or the one in Lagos? When did you start killing the girls? In Lagos, it was Lagos. That was where I had money from. The girl had some money that I can't eat. It's 2,000 dollars. So that was the morning I traveled down to Potai Court before I went to the It was after when I came to Potai Court. Okay, so you started in Lagos and you went to Potai Court? I mean, you were No, I came to Potai Court. But I went to the... Okay, then you still came back to... Yes, I saw the girl at the club. You saw the girl at the club? Yes, in that way, there were so many girls. No, there were so many girls. There were so many girls. There girls used to stay. Can you speak up? So that is the position now. There was a question that asked. <laughs> okay. I'm calling the phone. I'm talking to the phone. There's one boy that I'm talking to from me. At the hotel line. Hotel line. Is that the channel? Yes, he has a small shop.